On a white-hot day at the end of August 1940, an undercover British agent named George Bellows was working the dusty Spanish border town of Irún, keeping watch on the frantic comings and goings at the station. Spain was ruled by another fascist dictator, Generalissimo Francisco Franco, and teeming with Nazi informants but was officially neutral. Every day hundreds or even thousands of refugees were streaming over the frontier from France, some of whom might have vital information on what was going on under the heel of the Third Reich. Since Hitler's invasion and the evacuation at Dunkirk, British intelligence had lost virtually all contact with its closest continental neighbour. Its one-time extensive network of agents across France had either escaped, been killed, or been deemed unreliable. London was left dependent on the vagaries of aerial reconnaissance and sketchy reports from neutral diplomats and reporters to find out what Hitler and his alliés were doing, even while a Nazi invasion across the English Channel appeared to be imminent. Britain was fighting for its very survival, but was doing so almost blind. Bellos's eyes were drawn by a glamorous American making inquiries in the ticket office under the sinister glare of outsize banner portraits of Hitler, Mussolini and Franco. Intrigued, he drew closer and struck up a conversation with the young woman, who had just arrived from France and wished to take a train to Portugal, to continue on from there to Britain by ship. He introduced himself as a salesman, experienced in the challenges of wartime travel, and offered to help her secure her passage. As they got talking, Virginia recounted her extraordinary story to this reassuring companion, although as ever she was selective in what she revealed. Bellows heard about her ambulance driving under fire, and how she had journeyed alone across the length of a France railing from the humiliation of capitulation to Nazi Germany, and how she had to cross the heavily patrolled demarcation line that broadly followed the course of the River Loire, and divided the country into two distinct zones. She relayed in matter-of-fact detail how conditions were rapidly deteriorating in the South, the so-called free or non-occupied zone, nominally run from Vichy by the unelected Chief of State, Marshal Pétain. The occupied zone, composed of the north and west of France, was already under direct control of the Germans stationed in Paris, and she angrily described the curfews and food shortages, the widespread arrests, and the incident at a Renault factory when workers protesting working conditions had been lined up against the wall and shot. As he listened to her sharp yet impassioned account, Bellows grew astonished by Virginia's courage under fire, powers of observation, and most of all, her unqualified desire to help the French fight back. Trusting his instincts, he made the most important decision of his life, one that was to help revive hopes of an eventual Allied victory in France. When he bade Virginia farewell, he slipped her the phone number of a friend in London, who could help find her a worthwhile new role, and urged her to call him on her arrival. Even if the State Department did not appreciate her qualities, Bellows knew he had just encountered an exceptional force. Bellows did not give anything away, and judging by her visa application, Virginia seems to have assumed she would most likely be driving ambulances again once she reached England. In fact, the number belonged to Nicholas Boddington, a senior officer in the independent French or F section of a new and controversial British secret service. The Special Operations Executive had been approved on July 19, 1940, the day that Hitler had made a triumphant speech at the Reichstag in Berlin, boasting of his victories. In response, Winston Churchill had personally ordered SOE to set Europe ablaze through an unprecedented onslaught of sabotage, subversion and spying. He wanted SOE agents, in reality more special forces than spies, to find the way to light the flame of resistance, prove to the French and other subject nations that they were not alone, and prepare them to rise up against their Nazi occupiers. Through a new form of irregular warfare, as yet undefined and untested, they needed to prepare for the distant day when Britain could land its forces on the continent again. If this new paramilitary version of fifth columnists violated the old Queensbury rules of international conflict, involving codes of conduct, ranks and uniforms, then the Nazis had given them no choice. To serve in SOE, Churchill believed, would require a character able to pursue a noble cause with piratical daring. 
But SOE was, unsurprisingly, struggling to find men with the guile and guts it took to be secretly infiltrated into France without backup if things went wrong. No one had really thought of considering women for such potentially suicidal work. Yet Bellows believed the American he had found in Iron Station could be exactly what SOE needed. Virginia soon forgot about the phone number, though, because uncharacteristically she had a change of heart. Upon her arrival in London on September 1st, she felt reluctant to put her mother through any more angst, perhaps also doubting that she really could make herself useful. She presented herself at the American Embassy in London as a former State Department employee and a sked for a temporary job while she waited to be repatriated back home. Virinia was not initially made welcome. After all, she had resigned before from the service. True, her up-to-date knowledge of France was invaluable, and she obligingly wrote a detailed report on matters such as the curfew, food shortages, and the way that in her view the French were continuing to conduct themselves with dignity with the exception of prostitutes, whom she believed were shamelessly consorting with the Germans. The State Department, however, took more notice of her linguistic and typing skills. The military attaché needed a secretary. Within a fortnight she was behind a typewriter again. The weeks wore on, her nights largely sleepless as London braved the Blitz. Mrs Hall urged her daughter to speed up her return, and shortly before Christmas Virginia agreed to book the passage home, she thought was due to her as a former State Department staffer. No, she was informed, she was too late. She had allowed more than a year to elapse since her resignation, and was no longer eligible for an official ticket, and in wartime others were all but impossible to come by. Unexpectedly stuck in London alone, she dug out the telephone number she had been given in iron. Nicholas Boddington, an ex-Paris correspondent for Reuters, took the call and invited her to dinner early in the new year with his American wife, Elizabeth, at their smart white stucco home at 20 Charles Street in Mayfair, not far from where Virginia was staying. Although his round glasses lent him a scholarly air, Boddington could be a dilatory and even controversial character, known for his brutal lack of tact. Behind the blackout curtains that bitter winter's evening, however, he was at his most entertaining and put Virginia at her ease by banking up the fire and laying on as fine a meal as wartime conditions allowed. She had no idea of her host's real war job, or his exasperation at F-Section's continued failure to infiltrate a single agent after six months of trying, but soon she had him gripped by talk of her own plans. Now that she could not go home to America, she wanted to return to France. Speaking about her trip as breezily as if she were embarking on a holiday, and seemingly unfazed by the dangers or obstacles, she recounted how she had it all worked out, right down to how she would press her old contacts at the State Department to fast-track her application for a visa. She had also plotted her route via Barcelona in northern Spain, crossing the border by train to the French Riviera, ostensibly to help the Quakers' refugee relief effort but also taking the chance to report for newspapers back home. After all, as she pointed out to her exultant host as they finished their meal, as a supposedly neutral American she could travel into and around France quite openly. Early the next morning, January 15, 1941, Boddington rushed to the top-secret SOE offices at 64 Baker Street. He took the notoriously wobbly lift up to the fifth floor, and in a state of considerable excitement, dictated an urgent memo to the head of his section, known internally as F. It strikes me that this lady, a native of Baltimore, he informed F, might well be used for a mission, and that we might facilitate her voyage there and back, and stand her expenses on her trip in exchange for what service she could render us. The more Bodington thought about Virginia, the more exceptional the opportunity she appeared to offer SOE now under intense pressure to justify its existence through action. As she was American, there was no need for the sort of challenging clandestine sea landing or parachute drop that had so far proved beyond them. Neither did her accented French count as a problem, as she could operate under the cover of working as an American journalist, which would also explain her need to travel around and ask probing questions.
Such was his certainty of the value of the idea that Bodington had already instructed Captain Strong of MI5 to conduct a positive vetting of her, a rigorous screening process then known as putting her through the cards, or PTC. The PTC involved searching for traces of German connections in the vast vaults of cross-referenced paper files, kept on undesirables of every sort. It was a lengthy process, and F. swiftly agreed that Virginia was such a catch they could not wait. Well before her clean verdict was finally returned on February 17th, Virginia had been offered a job. This time it was not typing that anyone had in mind. Luckily, money was hardly the motivation, as the £500 a year on offer was barely more than she had been paid for sitting at a State Department desk. But how could Virginia, lover of adventure, otherwise stuck in a dead-end job in what she considered a dead-end life, resist entering France as a secret liaison officer? She would be the first female F-section agent and the first liaison officer of either sex. Tasked with coordinating the work of local resistance leaders and future SOE agents, her appointment was an outstanding act of faith in her abilities, which had for so long been belittled or ignored. She resigned again from the State Department and on April 1, 1941, started work on preparing for her secret mission without anyone understanding quite what it would involve. What did become clear was that SOE's new, most ungentlemanly brand of warfare would draw in large part on the terror waged against the British by Irish Republican paramilitaries. In the Anglo-Irish War of 1919-1921, the British had observed how regular troops could be defeated by a hostile population whose will had been stiffened by a few resolute gunmen. Now SOE agents would be expected to act as these Irish terrorist leaders had done, inspiring, controlling and assisting the French to rise up against their oppressors when the time was right and to eliminate without mercy those who got in the way. There was, however, a lot of groundwork to do before SOE had any hope of sparking what was in effect another French revolution. Advertising for recruits for such subversive work was obviously out of the question. The government never mentioned special operations executive in public and, if asked, would deny its very existence. Traditionally, British secret services had drawn from a shallow gene pool of posh boys raised on imperial adventure stories but this regard for breeding over intellect was scarcely a match for the ruthless barbarism of the Third Reich. MI6 operatives were accustomed to lying low and patiently gathering intelligence while avoiding direct action themselves. SOE agents would be different. They would observe, yes, but also recruit and train guerrilla forces to agitate, spread propaganda, and ultimately kill and destroy. As one intelligence writer has put it, if MI6 officers spotted enemy troops crossing a bridge, they would observe them from a distance and estimate their number, whereas SOE would simply demolish the bridge. The old-style spies were outraged by what they deemed to be a high-strategy-low-tactics approach, branding it by turns amateur, dangerous or bogus, and tried to thwart SOE's very inception. Unsurprisingly, Hugh Dalton, the pugnacious Labour minister whom Churchill had chosen to put in charge of SOE, found the search for a new type of rule. Breaking recruit capable of absolute secrecy and fanatical enthusiasm tough going. Died in the wool military types, with their concern for what they termed ethics, had to be kept away, as indeed did most of His Majesty's ministers. A cabinet colleague excluded the devout Anglo-Catholic Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax from SOE meetings, for instance, because he did not have what it took to make a gangster. Yet such was Britain's plight as she braced herself for invasion that the highest hopes were placed on SOE by Churchill himself. Others also saw it as an imaginative, if desperate, alternative to the frontal slogging matches of the First World War. Perhaps through cunning and courage it could help break Nazi power, while Britain worked flat out to build up the military might needed for an eventual return to the continent. And although no one could yet predict when that might be, any future attempted landing was always expected to be in France, making it the pivotal military theatre in the Western Hemisphere. Yet there was still no detailed plan or tested technique for stoking this rebellion. 
Virginia was joining what remained a Cinderella secret service, whose early days were marked by repeated failure. A boat carrying three agents to the coast of northern France had turned back when it had run into a German convoy. Another agent had boarded a plane to parachute in, but became terror-stricken at the last minute and refused to jump. Most recruits had not even got that far, pulling out horrified the minute they discovered what they were expected to do. Others were ejected once found to be mad or bad. Even in London F section numbered just eight people. The whole of SOE had just ten phone lines. It was a huge gamble in so many ways. Even if Virginia could make it safely into France, did the desk clerk from Baltimore really have what it took to succeed? Was there any real hope of creating a free France anyway, or was resistance just a fable? Early on, Dalton had promised that by the end of 1940, the slave lands overrun by Germany would rise up in rebellion, causing Nazi occupation to dissolve like snow in the spring. Certainly that had not happened. One prominent French patriot, for instance, had not been able to recruit more than five volunteers to form a fledgling resistance group after three desperate months of trying. So was there any support at all in France for Britain continuing the fight? Could the French people be transformed into effective paramilitaries to help the British wage the war against fascism, or would they simply become hostile servants of the Third Reich? Could a British-controlled agent even survive long enough in France to report back? SOE had no answers to these questions. The prospect of SOE service in the field was undoubtedly terrifying. So many backed out that SOE would later set up a cooler, a remote country house in the wilds of Scotland where quitters would be forcibly confined until what knowledge they had gleaned of SOE was of no use. As of July 1941, F section had just ten people still in training, of whom Virginia was the only woman and the only one with a disability, yet there is no mention of Virginia's prosthetic in her files. SOE seems to have been unbothered. Her superiors already knew she could drive from her time with the French ambulances. When she was asked whether she could ride a horse, sail a boat, shoot, scale mountains, ski or cycle, she answered yes, yes, yes. True, she admitted she could not box, nor most important for a secret agent, run. But for Virginia, this was the first time since her accident that she was not defined by it. She was not going to give up. Yet a frustrating series of events kept delaying her departure. It was as if the State Department, almost certainly unaware of the true reason for her trip to France, was deliberately holding her back even now, refusing to allow its London embassy to help push through her visas on the grounds that no special assistance should be given to Miss Hall. Unwilling to promote her within their own ranks, State Department officials seemed equally reluctant to allow her to plough her own furrow elsewhere. Perhaps her name was noted down somewhere in a file as having asked for special treatment before over her application to join the diplomatic service. In the meantime, in May 1941, SOE had finally successfully parachuted two agents, both French, into France. The aristocratic Pierre de Vomicourt was SOE's first circuit organiser, and Georges Beguet its first wireless operator, and therefore its sole direct communications link with France. Both were to become in different ways exceptional officers, but they could scarcely cover. The entire country of 250,000 square miles by themselves. Virginia's presence was more urgent than ever, but now there were problems with her journalistic cover. So he had used a go-between to approach Ralph Ingersoll, owner of the American magazine PM, to take her on as a stringer. We are not asking Miss Hall to do anything more than keep her eyes and ears open, Ingersoll was told. He said no. SOE had more luck with an extremely cordial George Backer, publisher of the New York Post, who agreed to arrange for Virginia to become his accredited correspondent. Backer was obviously aware of the ulterior motive. Although he knew to pretend otherwise, a delighted SOE operative reported back. There were, as ever in Virginia's life, further obstacles. Churchill's cabinet had forbidden women from front-line service of any sort. Government lawyers advised that women were particularly vulnerable if caught, as they were not recognised as combatants, 
and therefore not protected by international laws on war. Within SOE itself, old-fashioned attitudes were also widespread. There was considerable hostility at every level to the idea of a woman in any other than supporting roles such as decoders, typists, and couriers. Also, as Virginia was American, could she be trusted? It was standard intelligence policy to recruit only British citizens. Her country, in those pre-Pearl Harbour days, was not at war with Germany and was suspiciously friendly with the Vichy regime, which was proving deeply hostile to Britain. I have raised this question with C.D., the SOE chief, and the sections concerned, and I do not consider that she can be qualified as an intelligence agent, a senior security officer argued a few days after she joined the service. It now seemed as if her disability was the only thing not to count against her. In the end, Virginia's supporters won the day, persuading the doubters that the nationality of recruits was unimportant as long as they were loyal to the anti-Nazi cause and the British war effort. SOE would perforce need to be multinational. There could be no room for nationalism of any sort. And when the need to infiltrate agents into France was so urgent, the fact that one of the very few plausible candidates was a woman would simply have to be overlooked. Indeed, SOE decided in its desperation that it must and would be ready to work with any man, woman or institution, whether Roman Catholic or Masonic, Trotskyist or liberal, syndicalist or capitalist, rationalist or chauvinist, radical or conservative, Stalinist or anarchist, Gentile or Jew, that would help it beat the Nazis. So, SOE's urgency became Virginia's breakthrough. In true SOE style, the rulebook was discarded and her mission confirmed as liaison and intelligence in Vichy France. Although almost uniquely in SOE, she was not granted the recognition of an equivalent military rank, perhaps because her disability would have prevented her from passing a pre-commissioning medical test. It was an omission that would dog her for rest of the war, but for now, plain Miss Hall was given orders to report generally on operating conditions and to help other agents who would follow her in. Now finally, what SOE termed her special training could begin. Despite the wide-ranging scope of her mission, the induction was perfunctory and nothing like the extensive preparation given to later recruits. Over a few days locked away in a heavily guarded modern house hidden in the New Forest north of Bournemouth, she learned the basics of coding and of clandestine warfare and security, how to disseminate pro-British propaganda, how to use only cover names or code names in the field, and the importance of looking natural and ordinary while doing unnatural and extraordinary things. During days that started at six and went long into the evening, she learned how to spot a follower, look in a window, and lose him, double back. She picked up when to change an address, how to make secret inks, urine comes up brilliantly when subjected to heat, and even how to conceal her personality through altering a distinctive laugh, gesture or demeanour. She was shown how to seal microfilm documents, equivalent to nine sheets of letter-sized paper, in tiny containers and insert them in her navel or rectum, or as she discovered, in a handy little slot in her metal heel. She learned how to rifle files and go through a desk leaving no trace, even replacing dust on a smooth surface, and how to approach a guarded house noiselessly. A retired burglar came in to demonstrate how to pick locks. Staff dressed in German uniforms probably put her through the standard drill of a simulated Gestapo interrogation, or Verhoer, waking her up in the middle of the night with rifle butts, blazing lights, and shouts of Raus du Schweinehund. She was obviously already familiar with handling a gun, but was now taken through her paces on how to use one in anger. She may have been allowed to practice in the James Bond-style firing range under Baker Street tube station, belonging to the London Transport Rifle Club. Although in 1941, Britain was so short of ammunition, it is possible that she was allowed only to load and unload the favoured new Sten gun, rather than fire it. Most trainees had to practice with the dreadful old Tommy gun instead. She was trained to fire a range of weapons at SOE's disposal, although most agents, probably Virginia included, were in the first instance issued with the handily compact Colt 32 revolver. 
but due to the almost total lack of up-to-date intelligence on conditions in France, none of this training could truly prepare agents for the dangers in the field. Virtually the solar source of maps, for instance, was an old Michelin holiday guide from a London travel agency. SOE staffers were just guessing at the sort of things they were instructing us on. Another agent, Francis Camayats, remarked, they were trying to teach us something that they themselves didn't know. Indeed, there was very little to say about the core business of building up a resistance network from scratch in a foreign land behind enemy lines, because no one had really done it. With their privileged former lives in journalism and business, and as citizens of an island nation that had not been invaded for nearly a millennium, SOE staff officers in London had little concept of how ruthless an occupier could be. At the start, it must be confessed, we all thought of the whole business as a game, recalled one early agent who rapidly realised otherwise. A serious, deadly one, but a game nevertheless. There was amusement, excitement and adventure. But the Germans never saw it as a game, and Virginia was to be a pioneer in a whole new type of warfare, an amateur and improviser pitted against the professional brutality of the Gestapo and Vichy police. No records remain, or were perhaps ever made, of how she performed in training. It was generally accepted that in the field she would either learn fast or die. In any case, most of her colleagues thought all women incapable of such a demanding and dangerous job. It was up to her to survive and prove them wrong. Virginia's final briefing took place at the F section flat at Six Orchard Court, just behind Selfridge's department store in Portman Square. Arthur Park, a gold-toothed former doorman of the Paris branch of the National Westminster Bank, welcomed her into the thickly carpeted hallway by her field name of Germaine Lecontre. Although the flat was luxuriously furnished, agents often found their final memories of London were dominated by the bizarrely macabre bathroom, which had a black tub, black tiles, and a black basin with gleaming chrome taps. An SOE conducting officer instructed Virginia to inform her mother that she was going somewhere in Europe. She was then briefed on when she could exercise her licence to kill, and how. Her preferred method was to use one of the range of tablets supplied by SOE laboratories. What she called the pills were probably the lethal tablets, tiny rubber balls containing potassium cyanide also intended for her own use if she were being tortured and could no longer bear it. Their coating was insoluble, and if held in the mouth and swallowed whole, the pill could pass through the body without causing harm. But if chewed or the capsule broken and the contents added to food, death would come within 45 seconds. Under SOE's own brand of morality, and crucially where it departed from terrorism, she was instructed to kill only when her own or her comrade's security was in immediate danger. Her first elimination, they said, would be the hardest. Another sort of tablet produced a high fever and other symptoms of typhoid, and would be useful if a hospital visit could facilitate an escape. The morphine-based K-pills could also come in handy in such a situation as they could knock out someone, including a guard or even a nurse, for four hours. Most widely used, though, were the bitter-tasting blue benzodrine or amphetamine tablets. Sleep in the field would be a luxury, yet the mistakes made in tiredness were often fatal. Most took a couple of dozen with them and quickly asked for more. Now ready to go, on Saturday, August 23, 1941, Virginia left her old life behind her and headed for the ship to Lisbon and on into the unknown with barely a backward glance. No one in London gave Agent 3844 more than a 50-50 chance of surviving even the first few days. For all Virginia's qualities, dispatching a one-legged 35-year-old desk clerk on a blind mission into wartime, France was on paper an almost insane gambler. Her mission, codenamed Operation Geologist 5, would expose a hair to grinding fear and the perpetual likelihood of a grisly death. There was no reception committee to welcome her or ready circuit for her to join, but she was permitted, even obliged, to commit a range of crimes from subversion to murder. To survive, she must lead her double life to perfection and avoid capture at all costs. Her disability might help protect her, in that she made such an unlikely agent, 
but at the same time it rendered her more conspicuous. It was two years to the day since the war started when she strode purposefully toward the modest Hôtel de la Paix in Vichy, capital of the non-occupied zone. Thunderstorms growled ominously in the distance and the heat was suffocating after a long summer drought, but dozens of pairs of eyes fixed on this statuesque, flame-haired newcomer with an aristocratic bearing as she climbed the steps into the lobby. Anyone out of the ordinary was ripe for denunciation to the Germans or their Vichy underlings. The financial rewards were generous. The next day, September 4, 1941, Virginia registered her arrival at the Gendarmerie as an American citizen under her real name, telling them she was a special envoy for the New York Post. As proof, she pointed to the fact that she had already filed a story via Western Union Cable. Its publication was an early measure of her calm efficiency and cause for an outbreak of joy in Baker Street. Virginia had not only made it through her first hours, but had already established contact. There was at last a connection with the political heart of France after silence for so long. The article was ostensibly about how Pétain's administration was commandeering every inch of space in its new hometown, including hotel bathrooms. But what enthralled London was her reportage on the lack of taxis and how her newly acquired ration book allowed her only ten ounces of meat a week, ten ounces of bread a day, but no rice, spaghetti or chocolate. I haven't yet seen any butter and there is little milk and women are no longer entitled to buy cigarettes, was noted down word for word. These tiny threads of information could make the difference between life and death. And initially, London sought such intelligence above all else as it stepped up its efforts to infiltrate more agents into France. One operative walked into trouble, for instance, by not knowing that French cafés were forbidden to sell alcohol on alternate days. His ignorance immediately marked him out as an imposter, and he had to run for his life while the proprietor called the police. As letters were censored and the Germans listened in to phone conversations, Virginia was limited to what she could safely tell her controllers in her published articles. Some contained pre-agreed words as coded messages, but mostly she was making her points on Claire. She gave warning to Baker Street that even family postcards sent across the demarcation line were routinely checked, with the apparently innocent observation that one is not inclined to write at length on them or air any grievances. London had no direct way of contacting her. Virginia's status as a journalist was her sole protection against the sadistic, depraved genius of the Gestapo who were ever-present, even in the so-called free zone, albeit usually in plain clothes. So establishing her cover was Virginia's priority in her first few days. Combining a beatific smile with her genuine love of France, she cultivated senior Vichy bureaucrats and policemen and soon had them eating out of her hand by appealing to their patriotism and pride. In time, some would risk their own positions to save her life and help protect many others. As one historian has noted, she seems to have totally bewitched everybody who knew her. She also presented herself to the US ambassador, Admiral William Leahy, but he proved more resistant to her magic. American isolationism remained a formidable force and Washington had recognised Pétain's totalitarian regime despite its evident accommodation with the Nazis but President Roosevelt had plucked one of his old friends out of retirement as his envoy to handle relations with Vichy, precisely because he was worried that France would in some way help the Axis powers defeat Britain. Despite the public policy of non-intervention, America had already sent food and aid to the French to try to wean them off German support and win their allegiance. Leahy, so punctual when arriving and leaving work that a local luggage shop set its clock by his movements, thus saw it as his overriding duty to maintain courteous relations with the marshal, even as the Vichy government adopted some of the worst excesses of Nazi ideology under the banner of a new moral order for France. Pétain's repression of Jews or immigrants, as he referred to them, whom he had already banned from universities and the leading professions, was at this point often more draconian than Hitler's. Some of Leahy's more liberal colleagues nevertheless worried that his sympathy for the Vichy regime often seemed warmer than considerations of diplomatic and strategic expedie could account for. Leahy made it clear he did not want his staff, or other Americans, 
to associate themselves with any espionage activities in case it messed up his careful diplomatic choreography. He had already noticed this girl reporter in an otherwise male press pack with her independent attitude and thirst for knowledge and soon harboured suspicions. It was clear that she was cleverly winning over K-French officials and extracting far more information from them than her peers. Suzanne Bertillon, chief censor of the foreign press in Vichy's Ministry of Information, was just one who went out of her way to help Virginia from the beginning. There was something about this particular foreigner that commanded Bertillon's trust, and the two became friends. The fiercely Gaullist Bertillon not only avoided censoring Virginia's articles, but set up a network of 90 contacts across France to supply the American every week with information that proved vital for the British war effort. Virginia was thus able to collect intelligence on the location of ammunition and fuel depots, German troop movements, industrial production and a Nazi submarine base under construction in Marseille that was later destroyed by Allied bombs. Indeed, Virginia became so knowledgeable on the state of wartime France that Leahy's staff also surmised that she must be working for British intelligence. Soon she persuaded some of them to help her even if they risked their careers to do so, and they all had to be careful to cooperate out of the sight of the ambassador. Prominent among them was the American defence attaché Robert Shaw, who was, unknown to his boss, in contact with early members of the resistance. Later on, there is evidence that an African-American official named Johnny Nicholas was also directly involved. It is more than likely they crossed paths, but there are no records of meetings with Virginia, for good reason. It was a bold posting as no safe houses or false identify papers would have been available for him in case of trouble. The Nazis held a pathological hatred for black people, a comparative rarity in Europe at the time. When they took control of an area, they habitually set about rounding them up. Despite her progress in making contacts, Virginia faced formidable obstacles in those early days. She soon found that Vichy, a faded spa town with an operetta atmosphere, was too small and claustrophic in which to lead a full double life as reporter come spy. Despite Leahy's friendliness to the French regime, his embassy was under constant surveillance. In fact, the town was crawling with undercover Gestapo, who were increasingly predatory. The free zone may have been spared mass Nazi occupation, but its freedom was a pretense. The truth was, as one historian has put it, that Vichy France was firmly under German control once removed. Pétain was 85 by this time and almost certainly senile. He was kept alert by morning injections of amphetamines, although when these wore off in the afternoon, he was often difficult to rouse or simply incoherent, and yet he was still revered, despite shocking many supporters across France by his handshake with Hitler at Montoir, south of Paris, in October 1940, and by his espousal of collaboration with the Nazis. His actions had perversely had the effect of making many believe that to resist the Germans was to commit a crime. The marshal was seen by most French as the embodiment of whatever honour France had left, to go against a First World War military hero for most of a nation still stunned by the speed and ignominy of its capitulation was tantamount to treason. Also seen in the South as the final hedge against full-scale German occupation, he rationalised defeat into an opportunity for the power he had long craved. Pictures of him were plastered on classroom walls and shop windows. His effigy was on coins and stamps. In the face of such a powerful cult of personality, sustained by vicious muzzling of the independent press. Virginia discovered with dismay that there was precious little appetite to rejoin the fight. Pétain, subverting the legacy of French heroes such as Joan of Arc and Napoleon, had persuaded, or at least allowed, the French to believe that honour could be found in defeat.